Hello, everyone. This is Chris Kopak, immediate past president of APA. And this month, we're continuing our webinar series. Uh, one of the items that has come across very clearly through our recent member survey is that the webinars have been extremely helpful in giving back to our members that they can use useful information in running your universities, colleges, and our K through 12 facilities. Uh, today, I appreciate it very much that we have two uh, local guys here in Tucson, Arizona, uh, but they reach out throughout the entire country with water conservation measures. Uh, one is Damian Cox, president of EcoBlue. Uh, Damian, thank you very much for joining us today. And also Henry Johnstone, president of GLHN Architects and Engineering. Uh, GLHN is a firm here in Tucson that has been doing business for over 50 years. And Damien has the market, the North American market for the EcoBlue. So what we like to do as always, we will be uh, taking questions uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, this is about a 40, 45 minute presentation with about 10 to 15 minutes questions. And with that, building and utility plant water consumptions. How do we in our universities, when our cooling towers are using in some cases a half a billion gallons of water, uh, in the desert here in the Southwest, we wanna be extremely efficient with our water usage, but quite frankly, frankly, throughout the entire country. And both of these guys will be discussing that of creative ways and how we can look at our water consumption, uh, how it uh, is costed out throughout the entire country and then also creative ideas to go ahead and be even more conservative and efficient with our water usage. Uh, with that said, uh, we will have the presentation as always on a PowerPoint presentation. It'll be posted on the APA webpage, usually within a week along with the audio. And again, guys, Damien, Henry, thank you very much. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, educate our APA members. Damien? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chris, and uh, welcome, everybody, and thanks for taking time to join us today. Yes, I'm Damien uh, Cox from EcoBlue, and I'm originally from Australia. I've uh, been living in uh, the U.S. now since 2007, and as Chris said, our company uh, specializes in indoor water conservation. So um, I'm going to hand over to Henry in a moment, but I just want to walk you through the learning objectives of today's uh, presentation, which is to understand the range of current and projected costs of water and sewer by region. And we're gonna, Henry and I are gonna drill down and show you the water costs across uh, the US in, in the various states and cities. And it's quite complex uh, how water is priced in, in the US. And also the supply is quite uh, complex as well. We're also gonna review some data which is needed for a, a, re, a, a water audit for campuses. Um, Henry and I have done a lot of work here with the U of A on uh, water use on campus uh, with metering and other, other uh, uh, calculators we've developed. And we've got an appreciation also of the relative magnitudes of water uh, uh, consumption on campus and what the high water using fixtures uh, are on campus. And also we're going to consider current and developing opportunities to, as uh, Chris said, to reduce water consumption on, on campus. So first we're going to give you an outline of the complexity of water supply. Uh, particularly in the West, we're going to show a little video in a moment uh, of water in the West. And I hope the audio is going to uh, be good enough for you to, all to hear. And then we're going to talk about the uh, different uh, uh, challenges with uh, community water cost and consumption, scarcity, costs and trends, and some of the unique features that university campuses have. And also we're going to drill down then into the university campus water balance here for the University of Arizona. And then we're going to have a, a, a little brief summary at the end. So first, this is water in the West. This is a video and I hope the audio is going to work. And Henry, if you want to chime in here. Any yeah, this is just an idea of how complex water supply can be. I think this is probably true everywhere, but certainly in the West. Kind of eye-opening little video here. Seeing how one impact triggers reactions and triggers consequences in other areas, you begin to grasp a different understanding of the quote system. In the Colorado River, starting at the upper basin, we move the water out of the basin. In Wyoming, we move it to Cheyenne. In Colorado, we go across the Continental Divide to the Front Range City. Cross over to Utah. Central Utah Project takes the water all the way to the Wasatch Front. Come down to New Mexico. It moves it out of the Colorado River watershed to the Rio. To Albuquerque, Las 
Vegas uses it. 300 plus miles of Central Arizona Project Aqueduct goes to the central cities from Phoenix all the way down to Tucson. On the other side, it goes all the way to the coastal cities of Southern California. Because Metropolitan Water District of Southern California takes half its water from the Colorado River and half of its water from the Sacramento Bay Delta, they are connected. What happens in the Bay Delta matters in Cheyenne. It is one huge plumbing system that is intricately connected. When you start looking at the system in those terms, it changes your perspective. You want to say a few words while we just yeah. getting the video off here? Uh, yeah, I guess the idea there was just uh, we often think as uh, kind of consumers, users, you open the tap and water comes out. Uh, as you as you study this thing, it's just amazing how much is behind water supply. Certainly here in the West, but I think everywhere there are, are similar kinds of complexities. Yeah, thanks, Henry. So, yeah, so that little video uh, does show how complex water is, the, the supply of water is in the West, but also the price uh, of water across the country varies dramatically. And this little chart or graph shows the different cost of water in, in various uh, cities, about 30 US cities. And the little blue part of that uh, pie chart is the actual water cost, and the green part is the, is the wastewater cost. And a lot of uh, cities, this actual wastewater cost is higher um, than the cost of water, and that's often due to the amount of energy and chemicals required in, in cleansing. If you cast your eyes up to the, the left-hand side of the, of the map there where you see Seattle, you see they've got a very high cost of water, and then you car show right out of the southeast, you'll see Atlanta also the two highest uh, costs for metro water uh, in the US. And that's because they uh, have to comply with federal mandates for underground storage and they have to build new facilities. And the other big cost is Santa Fe, New Mexico. They've just built a big new pipeline there for the Rio Ground. So the water uh, does vary dramatically across uh, the country in, in pricing. And you'll notice in some of the southwest uh, areas, water is actually quite cheap compared to uh, uh, the areas where we have a lot more precipitation on the, in the Pacific Northwest and the Midwest and also in the, in the North and Southeast. And this is an interesting little uh, chart we found on increasing water and wastewater rates. Uh, this is across uh, tw 50 of the largest metro areas in the country. And it shows the increase in water and wastewater rates since 2012. And you can see the, the trend there that we're looking at rates in, in excess of 5% uh, increases each year. Uh, dating back from 2012 to 2017. And here locally uh, in Tucson, uh, I've been living in Tucson since 2007. And when I moved to Tucson, the water here was uh, cost combined water, wastewater was $4 for 1,000 gallons of water. And you can see now from 2008 to 2018, that's more than doubled. And the, uh, we've got the, we're lucky enough to get the water rates that uh, has been proposed here in Tucson through 2021. You can see that upward trend uh, continuing with the cost of uh, water and wastewater. And this is also an interesting little graph on showing the different cost of, of water across uh, three cities. And we've got Los Angeles on the left-hand side. They've got a combined water-wastewater cost for 1,000 gallons of just over $13. And if you move to the middle, you've got Seattle, which is around $25 for 1,000 gallons of water. So there's a huge variance there in the cost of water between Los Angeles and Seattle. And then we drop back down to Tucson, which is in the middle of the desert. And we had got about a ten dollar, uh, a little bit over ten dollars for a thousand gallons of water here in, in Tucson. And uh, what's driving these rates has been infrastructure debt and renewal, uh, supply, energy, and treatment costs has been increasing, and a lot of regulatory compliance now with clean water mandates. Uh, pension, healthcare costs have gone up for uh, water workers, and security safeguards since 9/11. But the biggest driver, I think, has been drought and scarcity is what's been driving um, water rates upwards. And then Henry, you might want to talk about this. Yeah, topic yeah. So, topic. so we we figured that well, there must be some relationship between the cost of water and the and the local consumption. So this is a little graph. Uh, actually, I think this was part of a UN study. So it's a global graph that compares per capita water consumption 
with the cost of water, and, and it's almost exactly what you'd expect, this inverse relationship. The cheaper the water is, the more consumption there is, and you certainly see that at the bottom. The U.S. and Canada, far and away the largest water consumers per capita compared to somewhere like Germany, where the price of water is, is really high. Uh, inevitably, that's a, a factor in the United States. We haven't seen a graph that's quite as uh, demonstrative as this one, though. Right. And just on that, Henry, that's a really good point. In Australia, where I uh, moved from the water in Australia, was incredibly cheap, and we were very high consumers of water in Australia, and we would have been uh, very close to the US and Canada, but over the last four or five years, they've put desalination plants into all of the major capital cities in Australia, and the cost of water has skyrocketed. So now our consumption in Australia is way down from where it was, and that's certainly has been a result of the increase in, in pricing. Yeah, so this is an interesting little graph that shows this is GPCD, that's that's uh, per capita water consumption. Uh, and you see here, this is sort of a, a, a graph of time from the 1950s to the 1990s, the per capita water consumption in the U.S. was just monotonically rising. Around 1990, though, it started to level off, and now we're on a pretty steep decline over the last five years in per capita water use. So it really gives you some hope that things can th things are changing. Right. And it's a good point here. In, in uh, 1990, the reason that little trend line is heading downwards is that in 1992, the US government brought in the Energy Policy Act, and all restroom fixtures uh, were now rated and um, weren't allowed to use more than a certain amount of water per flush, so the, there's more water-efficient toilets and urinals and hand sinks and shower heads around. So that's why that trend line is going down, and there's been a lot of uh, advances in that technology over the last uh, few years to continue that trend line. And that's a little, the little red dot there shows the high, the high point that where our water use peaked per capita back in 1990. And as I mentioned before, one of the big, the uh, big advances has been in, in uh, restroom fixtures. And the EPA uh, in the late 2000s brought in the water sense uh, compliance and certification. So all the restroom fixtures now a water sense approved, and that's been one of the big drivers in uh, reducing water use in toilets, uh, showers, urinals, and faucets, etc. So it's uh, it's not only about cost. This is a, a couple of little slides here, sort of geography slides. Uh, this graph shows you by state what the uh, per capita use is, and yeah, the water in the West. That that video. Those are among the darkest uh, states highlighted there. 100 gallons per person per day was the uh, aggregated number in 2015. And you notice uh, the, the lowest water use is over on the Far East Coast. Uh, kind of surprising. You just would assume that water costs would somehow scale with temperature and precipitation, but clearly, uh, clearly not in this case. The next uh, graph we have, just a couple other uh, ideas about what the major factors are in, in water consumption. This is the ASHRAE uh, climate zone map. And yeah, climate has a big impact here. Some of, uh, a big portion of water use uh, in hotter arid regions is uh, water cooled cooling equipment. So air conditioning, more air conditioning, you got the more cooling towers you run probably, uh, as well as just your, your uh, attitude toward, toward water. If you go to the next one, we look again at precipitation, and uh, this gives you an idea of where it rains, and clearly on the western side of the U.S., we're uh, uh, not raining so much, and that has a big effect on uh, water used in irrigation and grounds, and so um, clearly that's a, that's a big factor here in addition to cost. So one of the things we uh, kind of were fascinated by is uh, we've kind of done this research on the global water problem and the regional water problem, and uh, is the university a microcosm of what an urban environment is? Uh, and, and yeah, it is. It's, a, it's pretty high density, uh, high energy intensity, uh, mixed use kind of a community, uh, all within the, you know, the fence of the campus. There are some differences though. I mean, the resident population on a campus is not, does not behave the same way the resident population uh, in the suburbs does. The variable occupancy, certainly when the semester starts up, the consumption uh, follows um, uh, the school year. But one of the things I think is really fascinating is the opportunity that a university has, because it's got some centralized management control, its own utility system, to really do some, uh, some strategic planning, investment, and to be able to really control uh, how things are, are run. Here's a diagram that uh, kind of depicts on, a, on an overall scale with water and energy
energy flows into a campus here. This is kind of the first of a, a couple of slides I've got on the water energy nexus. And certainly you've got a campus uh, of the scale of the of University of Arizona, 12 million square feet, and you've got to pump a fair amount of natural gas in there to run the heat, the gas turbines. You've got to buy some electric power, uh, and that combines with the output of the turbines and runs the chiller plant. Uh, in the Sonoran Desert, the uh, chiller plant is a, is a major almost uh, life safety kind of a feature of our campus here, keeping everything cool. So we have to put power into that. But in order to run the chiller plant, we've got to, we've got to evaporate water in the cooling towers. So ultimately, all the heat that's pulled out of the buildings gets rejected through evaporation at the cooling towers. What we get here in, uh, in, in our area, and, and I suppose many areas along this, for the southern half of the U.S. where there's a fair number of cooling degree days, is the amount of water we spend for evaporation in the cooling towers is equivalent to the amount of water we're spending in, uh, in building use and in irrigation. Uh, many universities have, uh, have embarked on water master planning. Here, here's a couple, one at Stanford, one at Yale that, that, uh, that I looked at. Uh, and these were done a, a decade ago. These were done quite some time ago. It's just a rational planning process. First start with metering, collating data, auditing, analysis of, of the data, really figuring out, getting, getting arms around uh, where the flows are at any given time, uh, coming up with alternatives and evaluating the economics of those alternatives uh, and then implementation. And ultimately, I think in, in at least these two universities and probably others that have gone through this process, the end product is not just we implemented and we're done. It's an, it's a, an ongoing monitoring, uh, improving, monitoring, metering, trying some other stuff. Uh, it's kind of a, a, an ongoing process, ultimately. Uh, so I wanted to put this up here. This is the famous Lord Kelvin, and uh, this has been quoted many different ways, many times. I found the original. This is what he actually said uh, from the Institute of Civil Engineers. And I just want to, to bring your attention. So certainly, this is a thing that says if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. That's the simple, simple version here. But I really like the part that says if you can't express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. So fundamentally, in order to do any a project like this, in order to conserve water, you've got to understand uh, what the flows are, what the values are, what, the, what parameters you can compare against each other. Could you say that again? That just sounded so good. <laughs> I got your knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Uh, okay, so we're just going to talk briefly about uh, the University of Arizona, and, and we're really just using this as kind of an example of a typical campus. So certainly, uh, water is a is a big deal here, but the part of the campus brand, part of the student experience, has to do with how water is used. So irrigation is indeed a big part of this. Must maintain. Uh, the spaces that attract people. University, this university, 390 uh, acres, something like 12 million square feet, um, and the primary use of the water, which I think this is probably true ev everywhere, or most places, irrigation buildings and cooling are the, are the fundamental uses of water. Uh, at the university, now the university enjoys having some groundwater, a mixture of, of uh, Produced water coming out of their coming out of the aquifer directly below them. So there's a series of seven wells, and they purchase water from the public utility. That's Tucson water and uh, the groundwater, the blue and the red. Uh, reclaimed water. There's a fairly significant reclaimed water system in our community here, and so uh, university purchases a lot of reclaimed water, almost entirely for the use of uh, irrigation of grounds. If you look at the graph on the right, then you get a sense of how that water is distributed. Uh, and I just bring your attention to the green and the purple. Green being evaporation, annual evaporation in the cooling towers, purple being annual blowdown. We'll talk a little more about that. Uh, but the two of them together are over 50% of the total amount of water used on campus a year. Uh, there's been a series of improvements here, probably the last six years uh, when this started to track this thing. Uh, as I say, one of the first steps was to bring in better measurement and, and metering uh, system, equipment and systems. So then now there's a fairly sophisticated SCADA system on all the wells and the points of purchase from Tucson Water. Uh, there are domestic water meters in most of the buildings, certainly all the large buildings. Uh, those are now all up and running and uh, calibrated, checked, working well. 
Uh, that's been a that's been a big part in the in the irrigation department. Uh, fairly significant investment in a new irrigation control system, sort of a head end, uh, and devices out in the field. And then again in the plants, uh, a major effort to improve plant metering and be able to really get real time data uh, on all kinds of parameters involving ener energy and water. So in irrigation, just briefly, um, most of the irrigation. Well, first point we wanted to make is. Sort of a, an obvious question is, well, why can't we just harvest the water that falls on campus? That's a really an interesting question in a place like Tucson where it really rains uh, just about uh, two times a year. One of them is right about now, monsoon season. We get about half our rainfall, and the other half comes over a course of two months in the winter. Uh, so although we have the potential to collect 120 million gallons, which would be about 20% of the total you know, water uh, consumption here, the practicality of collecting that volume of water and storing it for use uh, is just really difficult. So we go, uh, we are able to, in, in, in sort of a building by building scale uh, system, put in cisterns, uh, and there's a number of projects where that's proven to, to work okay. Uh, but just as, a, as a, a theory of why can't we collect all our rainwater, pretty challenging engineering uh, problem and would be uh, financially quite expensive. So instead of that, we do a lot of xeriscaping. There's there's cactus. That's a great thing for uh, uh, low water use. Go to the next one there, and then certainly the uh, reclaimed water used in uh, irrigation uh, for for relatively small but very well uh, designed, uh, established, and maintained uh, planting areas and turf areas. Most of the athletic fields are uh, on reclaimed water. Not not all. Um, but that's kind of the uh, overall, wherever we can use reclaimed water uh, practically for, for uh, irrigation, it is used. And moving across to our building water consumption, I want to just run through a couple of case studies we did here at the university. One was a uh, residency hall, and we found here that uh, there were 7,000 students in the residency halls on campus, and their domestic water use is around almost 3.8 million gallons of water per year. And this is a little pie graph showing the, where the water is uh, into a water use by fixture. And you'll notice that showers is the, is the highest water user at 63%. We're able to go in and measure the, the water flow through these shower, the shower heads that they had on in, installed in their facilities. So I'll come back to that in a moment. But we also were able to look at the, at the these residency halls on campus. They uh, implemented throughout the 2000s some pretty aggressive uh, water efficiency initiatives and changed out toilets and urinals, um, shower heads, faucets, etc. And you can see the little blue bar on each one of those shows the water use in hand sinks, showers and toilets uh, before the change and what they were able to achieve after they went through and did these, uh, implemented these water efficiency initiatives. And then in 2018, they can even go further with their water efficiency and uh, because of the advances in technology. And the big uh, water use was, was showers, as I mentioned. So here we just put together a little a little uh, calculator on shower heads and across campus there's 7,000 people uh, showering once a day and they currently uh, or had two and a half uh, per minute uh, gallons per minute uh, shower heads and if they reduce those down to one and a half uh, gallons per minute they would save around 15 million gallons of water per year and the overall uh, water and energy savings is about $400,000. But the big uh, item you want to focus on is the water heating uh, saving, and that was almost $380,000 uh, in, in savings and moved to these water efficient shower heads. So whilst the water saving is, is great, uh, the uh, heating and energy savings is, is even greater. So just uh, encourage everyone the, that's out there and has res halls to look at their shower heads because they're a very uh, easy way and simple way to conserve water and doesn't require any behavioral changes by the uh, users. We're also able to look at the uh, restroom uh, water use on, by fixture on campus, and you'll notice here that, uh, and we want to just focus on the on toilets for a moment. 46% uh, of the total water use was in female toilets, and uh, obviously the uh, you'll notice that there in urinals there's only 20% of, of water use, and for the females they don't have an option as the guys do to go in and, and use the urinals. They have to use a toilet, so it's the same amount of water that's used each time they they go to the toilet, whether it's for liquid waste or solid waste. And one item that which, could, which I, I like are these dual, uh, which doesn't require any behavioral changes, are these dual flush handles, which you may or may not be familiar with. So with these particular handles, they're a simple 
retrofit, and that can reduce water use by 30% for liquid waste uh, when you push the handle. In this particular unit, you push the handle down. There's another, uh, there's two of these different uh, uh, flush units available in the marketplace. One of them is uh, what they call the uppercut, and you actually pull the handle up to get the, the liquid waste, uh, for liquid waste, and to get the water saving. And they did a behavioral study on these units at the University of Missouri. And they found that uh, in two buildings, they had uh, installed these units. Uh, one where you had to pull the handle up for the liquid waste. And the other building, they installed units where you got to push the handle down. And they found that in the building where they had to pull the handle up, because it was anti someone's normal behavior and pushing a handle down, they only got to achieve a water saving of 12%. But in the building where they working with a user's behavior and they're pushing the handles down, they achieved a water saving of 30%. And then this is just a sample project uh, we wanted to, to, to walk through with a, a building that had 20 non-efficient uh, urinals and 20 non-efficient toilets. And we've got uh, with 2,000 students and wanted to look at the uh, difference in uh, dollar cost and return on investment for a, for a university here in Tucson, for example, compared to a university in Los Angeles, compared to a university in Seattle. So you'll notice that the uh, university in Tucson, which has the lowest cost of water, they're roughly gonna save around $26,000 a year in cost by replacing non-efficient non urinals, non-efficient toilets with water efficient models. And in Los Angeles, up around 36,000, Seattle was almost $70,000. So <clears throat> the project summary, we can reduce water use by changing out these old uh, inefficient fixtures to water sense units. They wanna save in that particular building around 2.6, Seven million uh, gallons of water per annum, and the capital outlay was fixtures and installation was around twenty thousand dollars. Now in Seattle, because their water cost is so high in Seattle, their annual savings per year is about sixty-seven thousand dollars. Return on investments around three hundred and thirty percent, and the payback is three point six months. Uh, in Los Angeles, it's about thirty-six thousand dollars a year in savings and return on investment around one hundred eighty-four percent, and six and a half months to pay back uh, the initial investment. And in Tucson, where we have the lowest cost of water, the uh, return on investments ran 134% and uh, about 8.9 months to, uh, for payback. Uh, one thing which I didn't include in these calculations was that all of those uh, cities, all the water utilities and water conservation departments in those cities offer rebates. And if we included the rebates in, the, uh, in those uh, calculations, the, uh, Seattle would have had their return in about one, just over one month about one and a half months, and in LA, they'd be paid back in about three months, and in Tucson, it was about five months to, to pay back the, uh, the overall cost of that, uh, that, that investment and uh, project. So I'll move over to Henry now for building meter data. Right, right. I, I just want to tag on to what um, Damien said there. The, the, the reason these paybacks are looking really attractive is because the price of water is going up. Right. So a big incentive here to actually start doing stuff that for the last 20 years, we've known was available, but maybe not worthwhile doing. Now it's, it's worth looking at. Maybe it's gonna be uh, a financially uh, attractive kind of a thing. So these are just a couple of uh, images just uh, representing the kinds of data we're able to now collect from University of Arizona buildings. That's three different dormitories, like in uh, Coconino and Kaibab Huachuca. Uh, they're of different sizes, uh, different ages, different technologies. Um, Here's a, here's a graph when you normalize that by the number of beds, so that's water use divided by bed count. Now, you, there's a, a couple of erratic things that happen in the summertime there, but if you look during the school year, you know, September to October, uh, January through May, it's pretty remarkable that the uh, per capita student water use is very similar, dorm to dorm to dorm. It may have to do with the fact that there was a water fixture a uh, renewal pro program maybe five or six years ago. So they're all running on the same kind of technology and fixtures. And that's right, Andrew, because we uh, did a walk through all those uh, residency halls and they had identical fixtures uh, for toilets, uh, hand sinks and shower heads, which they all upgraded yeah. in the late 2000s. So they're all very consistent. But, but even now, even though that was just a few years ago, more recent uh, technological change in shower heads, you could, you could take another 25% out of this if you swept through there and changed out all the heads. Uh, so then another another image is just one particular building looking at it over a number of years. And this one's kind of interesting for the, because uh, the behavior changed from the first two years to the second two years. The kind of thing you could really evaluate building by building a trend 
uh, analysis. I think one of the things, uh, behavioral things, we've seen a lot of case studies where uh, competition in residence halls for water use is actually an effective way of, uh, of, of uh, reducing the shower times and reducing water consumption as a whole. And if you've got this kind of data, this can be real time on a screen in the lobby and the, and the students perhaps will pay attention to it. Uh, just another couple images here that I think are fascinating. This is the kind of data you get real time looking at a water meter over a course of a week or two. Uh, this is again a, a, a student dorm. So look at the real high point there where it hit about a thousand uh, or, or one, yeah, a thousand gallons of KGAL, uh, which is on uh, April 6th. That little spike, if you dial in one level more, that's about five o'clock in the afternoon, and this is a Friday. So you can tell that they were all gearing up for uh, party night. Uh, so, I mean, that's actually hourly data. So that uh, is great to, to track leaks and anything that's happening in, inside the facility. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, we've seen cases where uh, you first look at the monthly data and say, wow, this building is behaving different this February than it did last February. Then you auger into this level of detail and say, I see why that is. There's some valve not closed. There's a leak. And you can really see it hour by hour on this data set. Another another example, that was a dorm. This is a big rec hall where, again, a lot of students go to shower. Uh, okay, so I want to move into utility plants here. University of Arizona, like most universities, has a, some kind of a central utility system. Here there's three large central plants, uh, central cooling plants. Two of them have uh, steam boiling systems, and two of them have cogen. So it's kind of a mixture, but the utility, the, the, the water consumption is really focused into uh, the cooling towers and the boiler makeup in these plants, uh, which is the condensate makeup, which primarily that's RO, uh, that's the, uh, the boilers are fed with RO water, and so there's a fair amount of blowdown water there. There's a fair amount of water going into the RO system. Uh, chilled water makeup, it's a closed loop. Why would that be a, a, a water consumption issue? Well, when you got a leak and it's underground and nobody knows where it is, it goes on for a while, that's a, that's a challenge. That's a water consumption challenge. Uh, having the data, though, sure lets you figure out exactly when it started, what do, you, what do you gotta do to stop it? We used to see a lot of bearing cooling, a kind of direct use of water just once through. Uh, I would say in the last 20 years, in the kind of university plants I've been in, not very many uh, open water drains the way they used to be. The big, the big load of though is the cooling towers. Uh, so I thought I'd just uh, kind of briefly go through, uh, you know, the methodology to figure out what the ratio of water is, the water rate of a cooling power, uh, just to review this kind of thing. So if you were taking, if you had a 15,000 ton cooling load, a plant that's taken 15,000 tons out of the campus, uh, the cooling effect is 180 million BTUs an hour. If your chiller was uh, 0.5 kW per ton, that's a, that's a pretty decent chiller in, in, in today, you know, a chiller you might buy around now particularly on a hot day, able to do 0.5 kW per ton, not bad at all. Uh, that would correspond to 7,500 kilowatts into the chiller motor or the energy in, if you convert that to BTUs, it's 26. So the total amount of heat that you're pumping out of the cooling tower is a combination of the heat you're extracting from the campus plus the heat of compression, the heat that you're, the energy that you're putting in to the chiller to, um, uh, to get the heat out. So that turns out to 206. Uh, now, if you convert that total amount of BTUs we're dumping out the cooling tower into water, that turns into the 24,000 gallons an hour uh, to get 15,000 tons out. The other factor, though, in a cooling tower is the cycles of concentration. That's the amount of water you've got to draw off it, continuously draw off it, to keep the concentration of solids that are in the makeup water from building up to a level where they're going uh, to affect the efficiency of the chiller tubes. This is really the core of the energy water nexus of a chiller plant is uh, you, if you aren't spending enough water to keep the purity up, you scale the tubes and so you're trading water uh, on one side against energy efficiency on the chiller on the other. So at the bottom of this thing, you, you look at this at five cycles, that represents 25% of the water you're evaporating is now being wasted in order to hold a five cycle. Pretty typical in the Southwest anyway that we run at five cycles, maybe a little lower than that, which gives us a total makeup rate of two gallons per ton hour, which is a, kind of an interesting number when you think about gallons of milk and ton hours of air conditioning. It's a fair amount of water that you don't see, it's invisible, not really an obvious part of air conditioning. 
One other factor, I'm just doing a simple energy balance here. There really is an efficiency factor on a tower. So ultimately, it's going to be more than that. Uh, there is there are other reasons why we're subcooling the uh, discharge air. All right, go to the next one here. Uh, I don't want to linger too much on this, but this cycles of concentration thing always kind of bugs me. How much water we've got to waste in order to to evaporate? Uh, and I, I stuck the little formula in there to figure this out. Again, and we often think of, or I used to think of, five cycles of concentration as being a reasonable number. And what that means is, if you've got, let's say you've got um, uh, 50 parts per million of silica in the uh, incoming water, and you're trying to control your cycles of concentration or your your uh, silica level in the chiller tooth in the recirculating flow. Uh, to say 150 parts per million. Well, the cycles of concentration you need to achieve that is 150 divided by 50 or three. Uh, so that, that's the kind of thing that you got to really pay attention to if you're the chiller plant operator and you're trying to keep your tubes from fouling, which re represents not just a maintenance problem, but really the key thing is it's an efficiency problem. It's directly correlated to electric energy. Uh, okay, so let's move on. This is uh, this is kind of a surface plot. This is, uh, if you look at this thing, ton hours. That's the the load is in the vertical dimension. We've got the time of year in the in the uh, horizontal dimension, and the, the time of day. So this is a surface plot of the cooling load of a campus. The U of A looks a lot like this. Came from their data, and so you see on a peak day, the very spiky tips of these little mountains in here. That's the peak demand. That's where we get to see something like 30,000 tons on the hottest day of the year uh, here at the U of A. If you look at the, uh, the volume under this surface, if you thought about that as a big surface, what's underneath it? Well, that's the total amount of ton hours. That's the total cooling load we're pulling out of the campus over the course of a year. And that correlates almost directly into this campus water utilization. Every, every ton hour here represents two gallons of water. So that's a, a fairly simple, there's some simplification here. It's a little more complicated than this, but fundamentally, that's how we get to, of the university's 550 million gallons a year, uh, the cooling towers are consuming almost 300 million of it. Um, okay, so now I want to uh, sort of set the stage. This was a graphic that uh, we developed to try to visualize the energy water nexus. So what we've got here, Sankey diagram, the width of these lines corresponds to the uh, units of, of energy. And I got everything in energy, which is a little odd. I've, I'm converting cubic feet of water into BTUs. And I'm just doing that strictly by the fact that uh, there's 1,000 BTUs per pound of water. The latent heat of water is 1,000. So there's a way to just say, hey, water equals energy. At, at, and certainly from the standpoint of the central plant, that's what we're using it for, taking energy out. So this is a, a graph that's showing both the energy and the water flows starting at the at the utility uh, power plant down at the bottom there. So you're seeing fuel input uh, on the on the far left, the brown there. The fuel converts into electricity. Electricity being the red uh, at conventional power plant, it's about 40% efficient. So 60% of the energy, one way or another, uh, is is uh, leaving the uh, power plant uh, through cooling towers or through the stack. Uh, the other 40% is the red line going up to campus here. On the water side, then, it takes uh, an equivalent amount of energy to dissipate um, the plant in the cooling tower. So you can kind of get a sense of the amount of latent water in energy in looking uh, at the bottom of this graph. Uh, okay, let's go to the to sort of the blow up here. Go to the next slide. Yeah. All right, so then I blow up. Here's Here's the campus itself, those two dotted boxes. And there's the red line, that's the power coming into campus here. So we look at that as the power coming into campus goes two places, one of which is going to the chiller plant. That's running the chillers. That's, that's running the towers and the chillers. On the other side, it's really feeding the internal loads of the buildings. That's the lights, the computers, the people, uh, or not, not so much the people, the elevators, uh, whatever the electric demands are in a building, uh, end up being heat loads for the building air conditioning system. You see over on the far left there, the other components of the heat load, the envelope, the people, the ventilation. So all of those combined are the, are the energy we have to pull out. And you can see in the gray line there, that's, that's the uh, getting to the chiller plant. That's the amount of energy we're pulling out. Ultimately, those two combine. We talked about that. 
and we and we uh, dissipate it through the cooling tower. On the on the blue side, you're seeing a little line there that uh, kind of little U-shaped line draining down. That's the blowdown. So if you hit the button here, two key parameters in this: the coefficient of performance, how efficient your chiller plant is, gives you an idea of the ratio of how much electric energy it takes to pull the rest of the heat out of this thing. Uh, on the uh, on the water side, the cycles of concentration is the ratio of the amount of water that you're blowing down in order to keep the the, uh, the chillers efficient. One thing I really want to make a point here, there's this close coupling between energy efficiency and cooling tower water use. The less energy you're extracting out of campus, the more efficient your buildings and distribution system, the more efficient your plant is, the less water you have to pull out of this thing. And where in the past we've always kind of looked at energy conservation measures on their own kind of standalone thing, Really, there's a water component here, and as the price of water gets more uh, gets higher, uh, we really need to start to think about what's the water savings in an energy conservation measure. Uh, okay, so here's just a quick comparison. That's a water cooled. We just talked about that. If you hit this again, this is the an alternative, which would be an air cooled system. Interestingly, we uh, I always assumed as a mechanical engineer, hey, at the water cooled uh, central plant, it's going to be so much more efficient. Uh, than an air-cooled system that it always makes sense to do it. And most of the time, it really does. And on the university setting, maybe that's still always going to be the case. Uh, but what you see here is uh, if you had a 0.5 kW per ton on a water-cooled system uh, and a 0.9 on an air-cooled system, you can see, yeah, they were, we're using a lot more electricity on the air-cooled system. But the effect back at the power plant isn't as significant as you might think. So yeah, we're using more water in the case of an air-cooled chiller back at the plant, but it's not enough to compensate for the amount of extra water we're using in an air-cooled system. All right, that was my little Sankey diagram. So another thing that I think is really interesting and a trend we're seeing here is uh, if you start to now look at the ratio of water cost to electric energy cost in a chiller plant, and this graph is giving you an idea of uh, what are those costs for a thousand ton plant. Certainly the air cooled plant doesn't care. Uh, the independent of water, but a water cooled plant, the higher the water cost, the, the more overall cost that's gonna induce. Yeah, five years ago, it was a slam dunk. It's gonna be a water cooled plant every time. We're now approaching as we get water rates getting into the seven, eight, nine, ten dollars a CCF range, we're starting to approach the place where we where if you just do a direct comparison at our, uh, our electric cost and our water cost, you'd say, "Woo, it's almost uh, cheaper to do um, air cool." EIA, the uh, federal uh, agency that looks at this stuff, is projecting electric costs over the next 20 years to be relatively stable and water costs to be increasing. So this this is something to pay attention to. All right, I'm kind of rounding the clubhouse turn here. What are things we can do to improve water consumption in cooling towers and on campus? Well, certainly working on the cycles of concentration, which involves more sensitive control, uh, more attention to chemical treatment. Maybe there's a way to eke out a little more out of your uh, water treatment guys. Uh, we always wonder why we can't use that blowdown water for some other valid use. Problem is it doesn't grow green grass very well, and there isn't a heck of a lot else you can do with it. Um, so I talked about uh, reducing the cooling load, big effect, uh, and we've talked uh, about um, air-cooled uh, heat pump. The uh, Stanford University converted to heat pumps, made a big impact on their plant water consumption because their cooling towers dropped off quite a bit. Uh, but I want to just kind of end with what are our opportunities here, at least in, in our region now, which are uh, uh, cascading. We're using non-potable water instead of domestic water for running the cooling towers. So again, another Sankey diagram, this on the left is showing the inflow to campus here. And you see it splits two ways. One way it's going to uh, potable water to the buildings and then that comes out as, as uh, water going to drain to the sewer, showers, toilets, urinals, all that kind of stuff. That's going to the drain. I gotta go back up. Uh, and then the other half of it splitting there, you see part of it going down. The purple at the very bottom is the plant flow down. The gray that's poking its way up, that's the evaporation. All of this, uh, with the exception of the evaporation is going to the county sewer system now. The opportunity is to take, uh, recover that water, treat that water at the county sewer system and pump it back onto campus. And that's gonna uh, represent it since we use about half of our water is cooling towers. If we could use reclaimed water, that would cut campus domestic water uh, in about half. 
So one way to do that, we talked about that we're lucky enough in Tucson to have a fairly large reclaim water system network through campus. Well, we can connect onto that and uh, not, not uh, insignificantly figure out how to manage the chemistry of that water in, a, in an effective way that doesn't ruin the heat exchangers. Uh, that would be one way to do it. Another that we've seen elsewhere, uh, Emory University has one of these uh, setups here. This is a local water treatment plant right in on campus here that's uh, col uh, collecting waste, the liquids from wastewater, processing it to the point where it can be recycled in a cooling tower. So finally, the silver bullet. This is what uh, COPAC always wants is, uh, you know, give me the silver bullet here. The one thing that's cheap and easy and will solve all my problems. Uh, well, that's really hard to find. It has to be efficient <laughs> and cost effective. That's really hard to find. But one thing that I, I've certainly thought about, and maybe many of you have, is, well, why can't we somehow just collect the moisture that's coming off the top of the cooling tower and drain it back into this thing? It's, it's almost like a perpetual motion thing, but it seems like there should be some potential to do that. And that's a, you know, it's, it's been out there for quite some time. What I found just a month ago was there some, uh, a student group actually, uh, uh, some kind of a student research project at MIT where they figured out that if you shoot ion beams into the plume, you ionize the part, the small droplets, there, maybe it's even smaller than that, you ionize the flow so then now it's attracted to that screen and if you design the screen right, it somehow flows flows off there. Are, so you, this, are you making this up, Henry? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm just, <laughs> these kids at MIT might be, but uh, no, this, it, so all I wanted to, to leave you with is I think there's globally there's a lot of R&D going on uh, and, and some innovative idea like this might actually work and might actually catch hold. Okay, so we'll summarize here. Yeah, again, uh, as the water rates go up, this is a, probably a good thing from the standpoint of, uh, of uh, water consumption because it really does drive efficiency and innovation. Uh, w we've seen, uh, you know, many successful examples where a rational planning process on a campus, get your arms around the data, figure out alternatives, look at the economics, implement. That that actually has proven to work pretty well and, and, and we think that's really the way forward for a university. And also now there's a very attractive return now on investment um, and mainly as Henry mentioned before, due to the this increase in water rates that's happened and is continues is going to continue to happen over the next few years. So it's very attractive now to do uh, water invest in, in water efficiency fixtures, and also a lot of the re, uh, the water conservation and water departments have water conservation teams which run programs which provide really generous rebates now for high efficiency fixtures. They drill down into cooling towers, and they also have some nice innovation credits now if you're bringing uh, water efficiency and a lot of the water utilities are giving uh, rebates for innovation credits, and also. We believe that on our campus domestic water use, it's you know um, you can reduce your water use up to 50% with all of the advances now in technology with restroom fixtures and efficiencies, etc. So those are you, Chris, for any questions? I well, there is. I'll, I'll tell you. And thank you, Damian. Thank you, uh, Henry. A uh, lot of information, a lot of detailed information. While we're going through questions because they're they're coming in, we're not going to have enough time. But if you do have questions, go ahead and send them to us. If we don't get them to you. We'll go ahead and answer them and then send them on our uh, Apple webpage. And maybe we can put that slide up too about the metrics as we're going through the rest of the questions. Okay. And so we do we do have GLHN and EcoBlue doing a detailed water conservation review of our 11 million square feet at the University of Arizona. Uh, one of the questions, it, it, it relates to the silica. And you talked about silica into the water systems, into the equipment and the negative impact on that. Mm -hmm. uh, can you can you go over that again a little briefly? And also possibly the turbine, could it get involved in any of your turbine at all? Uh, sure, yeah, yeah, silica is a uh, dissolved uh, solid in in the incoming water. So we experience that here in, uh, in our water stream. Uh, it's not really a problem unless it gets to a concentration of something on the order of 150 parts per million. And it's gotta be, say that a, a little cautiously, in the chillers that we have running with refrigerant temperatures and that we, the, uh, that we are running at 150 is about the number, where if you get above that for much time at all, it starts to plate out on the tubes. So it's like a critical thing. It's gonna plate out at 150. The incoming water is pretty consistently in the, in the 25 to 35 range. So that what, you, what we have to do in, in these cooling towers is continually blow off water 
so that the recirculating stream that's going through the chillers doesn't get over that, that 150. That's perfect. We're going to do this rapid fire. We have so many questions coming in. As Thomas uh, Williams mentioned, the, the video at the beginning, he believes it came from Beyond the Mirage. Yeah, that's right. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's a movie on water called Bo uh, Beyond the Mirage. You can go ahead and Google that, uh, YouTube it. Uh, we also have a question that comes about blowdown. Uh, and this is from Eon. And so, Eon, good hearing from you. Uh, how do you blow down rate? How, how do the blowdown rates vary with water quality? Hard, soft, neutral makeup. A absolutely, it's a it's a great question, and that that really is at the core of this. Uh, I think we used to when water was cheap and we didn't care. You'd have a manual valve, and you'd just uh, over time figure out how much you had to open that valve to keep the tubes from fouling. And there was really no science or physics. Or engineering behind it. It was just let's keep bleeding off water, kind of the way I do my vap cooler at home. But as as time's gone on and as it's become more critical that we that we manage this blowdown, uh, we do it a number of different ways. The, probably the most common way is conductivity. You look at the electrical conductivity of the water stream that correlates to the uh, amount of uh, 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 calcium that's in the water, and and therefore indirectly you say, well, if the conductivity is this. Uh, that will correlate to a uh, dissolved solid value of that, and that's what we're controlling to. Excellent. We, we're going to have a question on rebates here in just one minute, but another one regarding our utility plants from Christopher uh, Radminski. Uh, how does the campus how does the campus balancing tower cycles of concentrate uh, with the Legionella risk? Oh, sure. Which yeah. is a big concern. And FYI. Go to our APA webpage on our webinar series. We've done a series just on Legionella, a whole yeah. presentation. Yeah, yeah, and Legionella is another whole animal uh, in and of itself. Um, blowdown is an important, it, to keep the dissolved solids down, blowdown is important. I think in controlling Legionella, there's a number of other factors. Uh, actual solids in the tower make a difference. Uh, the amount of iron in the, in the recirculating water makes a difference. Uh, I, I probably don't have enough time to really get into this thing, but there, it, it is a quite complicated chemistry and physics problem to balance all of the chemistry and, and do that cost effectively. Excellent. Damien, if you can, I know we have Adam Polak on the line here too, and we appreciate it. We got hundreds of folks, so this is a, a excellent topic, especially coming out here from the desert and the Grand Canyon, Colorado River, and how important that is. Rebates and being wa our water conservation. Uh, talk about that just a little bit more, what the universities need to look at. Yeah, sure. A good good question. Uh, so with rebates, um, it varies from uh, water utility to water utility, but essentially uh, here in, on the West Coast, uh, all the water utilities, or most of the water utilities, are offering rebates for uh, commercial toilets, so high-efficiency water center-proof toilets, and that varies uh, from $250 uh, per toilet in somewhere like Los Angeles to $100 in uh, Seattle. Uh, here in Tucson, that's $150. And then for urinal systems, uh, for water, water sense urinal systems in uh, Los Angeles, that uh, is $500 for a, a urinal, a water sense approved urinal in uh, Los Angeles. Here in Tucson, that's $200. So the rebates do vary from, uh, from place to place, but uh, there's some, you can go onto a, there's a website that, which, which tracks all the, the rebates nationally. So I'd encourage you to, to check on that, uh, on that website. I can send that, that website out, Chris, later on if they need it. Excellent. And Henry, if you would, uh, what about water master plan? A comment on that, because that's critical to have a, a detailed master plan in place, sure. a water master plan. Yeah, sure. That's, uh, I think the, the first step is to, uh, is to decide that you're going to plan this thing. And sure, it starts with the, with the Lord Kelvin uh, statement here. It's going to be really hard to plan stuff unless you have granular information on uh, what, the cons what the consumers are, what are they using it for, how much of it's going to waste. Uh, and when these uh, when these events are occurring. So certainly a water master plan really best starts with we've got a metering system in place and we're sh and we've, we've got some confidence that it's, that it's going to go. Then you integrate in. All right. Now let's let's look at some more global kinds of information. Uh, the idea of, uh, uh, of our cooling load, for example, or our steam load uh, really get down into that and correlate that with with water consumption. Uh, ultimately, you get to a point where you say, okay, I, I know where the problems are. I know where we've got the biggest opportunities. Now we get into a kind of high-level engineering of evaluating alternatives. We can, we can look at the, the, the economic benefit of changing out toilets versus changing out shower heads. 
we can look at the economic benefit of uh, uh, working in residence halls compared to uh, administrative buildings, um, really come up with a, with a tight list of priorities, and for each priority, uh, an idea of what the ROI is, because ultimately none of this is going to happen unless you've got ROI. And if we can here, we got about five minutes left. Uh, Damon, you talked about Australia, your home home country, and how, the, if I heard you correctly, the water consumption has dropped. It has. Yeah. Uh, what 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 caused that? What led to the, that reduction? You know, good question, Chris. So in Australia's got a, has a very similar um, a similar layout to what's happening here on the on the southwest and the west coast of the U.S., where we have a major river that uh, provides all the agricultural uh, states, uh, similar to the Colorado River. And we had a huge drought came through Australia in the late early 2000s, mid 2000s, uh, which was a, which caused massive uh, water shortages, obviously, and also pushed rates up, but also call, uh, forced a lot of the water utilities in these major metropolitan areas to uh, improve infrastructure. And the major thing they, that all the cities did was put in uh, desalination plants. And the desalination plants were hugely expensive and water rates went up accordingly. And once water rates went up to the levels they are now, like in, when I left Australia in 2006, water rates were very similar to what they were here in Tucson when I arrived in Tucson. So it was about $4 uh, for a thousand gallons of water in most of the metropolitan uh, cities in Australia, or major capital cities, I should say. And now those capital cities in Australia, their water cost is very similar to the cost of water in Seattle, which is like $25, $26 for a thousand gallons of water. So the cost of water there has increased almost five times from where it was. And that's driven uh, people to conserve water purely and simply because of the economics of water is so expensive now. And that's the trend that I've been seeing in the U.S. since I moved here where water rates are increasing. So as they're increasing, uh, one of the questions comes in from James McMullen, and it goes back to that first slide, one of the first slides about Seattle and looking at the country as a whole and the high rates. Why exactly, again, is Seattle sewer cost so high? Right. Yeah, good question. So in Seattle, uh, their wastewater treatment process is, uh, is very expensive because they have an outflow that goes out into the Puget Sound, and the water has to be uh, treated uh, to such a high, um, high level for it to, to be going out in the, in the Puget Sound to protect their uh, fish population off the coast. So the wastewater treatment cost there is very expensive in Seattle, um, as you saw, and also in Portland and Oregon. They've got a very high uh, wastewater treatment cost as well uh, because of that reason. Well, we, we like eating fish, and we want to make sure that's healthy, so <laughs> that's for sure. A uh, couple other quick questions here, and this is from Adam Keeling. Uh, Henry, is there a source for water use intensity benchmarks based on building use type? There is. There is. In fact, there's a university source uh, whose name is STARS. Right. right. Yes. Uh, and there's a there's a website that actually, uh, I don't know how uh, accurate or, or often it is updated, but it is very interesting to compare uh, campus to campus. That's a good question. So uh, the Energy Star Portfolio Manager through EPA, they have an energy use um, intensity uh, metric, and they're also developing a water use uh, intensity metric as well for buildings. So um, I, I don't, at the moment, it's only available for multi-family buildings, but I know they are developing the, the program to include uh, other buildings as well. We're, we're going to run out of time, and we probably have 20 more questions, so uh, excellent topic. Uh, this is about reclaimed water, and I know here in the, in the southwest that reclaimed water for irrigation is critical. What about the use for irrigation uh, using reclaimed water, or excuse me, using uh, blowdown? For, for uh, irrigation, and then also using reclaimed water for cooling towers? Yeah, I think the, fir the first question, can you use blowdown water for irrigation? The, the problem is, is we've seen demonstrated a number of times, but certainly when we've talked to landscape architects and botanists, the real problem is the salt concentration in the blowdown. We're blowing it down because it's concentrated, and that generally is going to be tough on plant species. There's some, there's some that will thrive. Salt cedar is one. Things that tend to have very small uh, leaf area and probably gray in color. <laughs> uh, so, so there's that. From the reclaim standpoint, we're seeing um, we're seeing that across the country, across the world, in in the Arab world, some of the large cities uh, on the Arabian coast there are they're cooled almost entirely with large district cooling systems running on what they call treated sewage effluent. It, their their cost of water. Uh, exceeds even that of Seattle, and their only real option is to take reclaimed water back to the cooling towers. Well, guys, you bring a wealth of knowledge here. We, we truly appreciate it, not only here at the University of Arizona, but also uh, throughout our APA family of our universities and college. Henry, I know you've been traveling uh, throughout the world. You were in Dubai recently looking at some cooling towers yeah. there. Uh, Damien, with your experience in North America, and then also Australia, and we appreciate that very much. 
We have a lot more questions. We're going to go ahead and answer the questions, but Damon, you got some final thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, I think, Chris, the, the major takeaway I have since I've been living in the U.S. is the, is the cost of water. And uh, when I first moved here in 2006, there was a lot of places that, uh, that weren't interested in, in, in uh, water implementing water efficiency because there was no return on investment. It was very small because of the, the cost of water. But now that uh, water rates are, are continuing to, to escalate, there really is now some great advantages in uh, in saving water and a great return on investment. And as I said, look, in, look into uh, the low-hanging fruit, which we look at, it was shower heads. I think faucets and hand sinks is a, is a huge area to conserve water on, on campuses it was, it was with hand sinks uh, for, for hand washing and also for toilets as well, particularly on female toilets. It's a, it's a big item to look at for, for water use and water savings. Thank you, Damien. Henry? Yeah, and I, I think the thing that uh, I'm left with is this concept of the energy water nexus and how interrelated both of those are. We've, we've spent most of, or I've spent most of my career focused on energy, and it's now becoming clear uh, that water is uh, closely coupled with energy, and anything I can do to save energy probably has an effect on water. That's perfect. Well, guys, thanks again. We've run out of time and not enough time on some great questions. If we didn't get to your questions, again, uh, we will go ahead and post those on our Apple webpage in about a week or so. And so, Henry, Henry, Damien, we appreciate it very much. Uh, and again, this is Apple's way of giving back to our members. Uh, we will continue doing the webinars. Uh, they have been very positive, uh, as I mentioned in the recent member survey. And speaking of the member survey, in the very near future at one of our webinars, we're going to be reviewing the metrics, the details that came from that recent member survey. And again, webinars was one. Uh, we'll be looking at a deferred maintenance uh, presentation as we've done in the past. Uh, and Henry, I got to say, this Lord Kelvin, uh, I love it. <laughs> you know, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Right. And that's what we all have to do. Uh, so we'll be looking. Our next webinar is going to be on a little off cycle a little bit on September 20th. Uh, we have several different topics, again, we'll be looking at. We also have Gary Gleason. We'll be doing a steam boiler uh, overview. Uh, excellent, excellent topic. Uh, we had Gary uh, recently out here. Uh, ASHRAE, we continue to partnership. Had a great call with them this morning on a number of initiatives that APA and ASHRAE will be partnering on over the next three years. Uh, and again, we'll be looking at the APA strategic initiatives and the realignment of our committees. And that will be discussed in detail at a future webinar also. So these webinars are good for CE CEUs. Henry? Damien, thank you very much, and thank you, everybody, for joining. We had a really, really large crowd. Thanks, everybody. Bye.